All right. Something that we're actually here for. Exodus 17. It's apocalypse time. You're like, what? Yes, I promise. Um, the danger that we have in a modern world obsessed with the end times, which I think COVID made that worse. I mean, you, you can't find a, a popular Christian ministry that hasn't gone in that direction at least once or twice. The danger that we get in the obsession with trying to read the book of Revelation into everything, or maybe trying to read everything into the book of Revelation, is that when we get texts that are actually pointing us to God's work in history, we miss it because we're not actually paying attention and looking for it. This is actually one of those texts and I promise, and the reason I say that is because anything you want, anytime you want to understand end time stuff, who do you have to go through to see it rightly? The Bible. Who does the Bible point to? God. Specifically? Jesus. There it is. Give me the Sunday school answer. Jesus. If you want to understand your apocalypse, you have to go through Christ. If you want to understand your Old Testament, you have to go through Christ. You have God instructing his people. Therefore, we understand our Bible rightly when we see what is happening within it correctly. But we, So that's our regular timeline, but also when we see it in light of the overarching plan of God. Does that make sense? Because that is what we're going to try to do today. And believe it or not, we're going to be doing a lot of fast forwarding. So, Exodus 17, verses 8 through 16. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out, fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, The Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Dun, da, da, da. Believe it or not, that connects us to a whole bunch of stuff. Believe it or not, I know. I, I say that every week, and the answer is always, of course we should believe it at this point. So, let's rewind to the beginning. Then Amalek. All right, time out. Just because it's too much fun not to. What's an Amalek? Exactly. I'd look it up too. Genesis 36. These then are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, Adah. Ruel, the son of Esau's wife, Basimath. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, and Gatam, and Kenaz. Again, if you're looking for some names for newborn grandchildren, not going to be too many Kenazes and Zephos running around. So you'll get some unique names. And it'll be a Bible name. He said, I named all my grandchildren after the Bible. Zepho. You'll get him digging, if nothing else, right? Timnah was a concubine of Esau's son Eliphaz, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. Now, why do we care? Who's Esau? Anybody remember? Yeah. Eldest son that didn't get anything, right? He's the older brother of, who's his, who's his little brother? Jacob is his little brother, and how are they born? They are born fighting. Esau is out, and, and, and Jacob is right on his heels. Um, nothing has changed. <laughs> nothing has changed. See, be nice to your siblings. Your great-great-great-great-grandchildren will be slaughtering each other in the fields of Rephidim if you're not. I think that's the lesson, right? If it's not before, it is now. So that Amalek is coming, and they fought against Israel at Rephidim. Now, this is where we get our good question. Is this a good time for Israel? What just happened? What did we talk about last week? Israel was whining yet again, right? No warning, or you know, no water, nothing that they want, so they're complaining to God. God bears their punishment on their behalf, the striking of the rock to produce the life-giving water. So Israel is, is Israel soaring at the heights of their faithfulness to God? No, not even a little bit. When you're in a bad mood, do you want to go fight somebody? 
<laughs> you might, but when you're trusting in God to deliver you in battle and to take care of all these things and you're not exactly walking in his ways, are you sure you want to go that way? Yeah, you start thinking, start looking around going, how good are, no, never mind, this is not a good idea. Remember what Paul told us in 1 Corinthians. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to, but beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Always remember that the ultimate escape from your temptation is not in your wisdom, not in your brilliance, but it is, always has been, and always will be in God. 1 Peter 5, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. And the other lesson is, and this is one straight from Peter, sometimes that escape is not in the here and now. Go back to chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And that's not just, um, that's not just Peter. Paul gives you the same lesson, Colossians 3. If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are, for you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. There's a, there's a terrible phrase in American life that um, the, the pagan world likes to use against us, and unfortunately too many good churches have tried to use it as well. You can't be too heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. It's terrible advice. You can't be any earthly good unless you are first heavenly minded. You are only good in the here and now as you are focused on that which is to come. Because when you focus on the here and now, you will disorder your desires, change the motivations of your heart, and act wrongly. You will see the things of this world as the means unto themselves, the ends that they are not. But when you are heavenly minded, seeking the revelation that is to come, the salvation that is to be revealed at the last time, the peace with God when sin is done away with. Now I see the things of this world rightly. I don't see my children as little copies of me. I see them as image bearers of God needing to be trained and taught in ways that honor Him because that is why God has made them. I don't see my job as a way that I get a paycheck so I don't starve to death. I see it as a vocation that God has given to praise Him and honor Him by my work and how I serve day in and day out. I have to look forward to work rightly now. That's what this is going on here. That's one of the reasons why this fight needs to be here and it needs to be now. So, verse 9. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us. Go out and fight against Amalek as he should. Where is Israel going? I mean, that's the song, right? I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, would you come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. Hey! <laughs> Always remember, specials this week. Be sure to tip your waitress. <laughs> That's where they're going, though. They are headed towards the promised land. Now, this is an easy one. Don't overthink it. Are they in the promised land yet? No. So, the rule of life, if you haven't gotten to where you're going, you aren't there yet. Now, if God has promised, and He has, Exodus 3, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, has God delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians? Yes. Did he do that with great power and demonstration of who he is and what he is capable of? Absolutely. The plagues, the Red Sea. Has he continued to uphold them? Yes. The quail, the manna, water multiple times. Which means, if he's done all of that in fulfillment of that half of the promise, we're still waiting for the other half of the promise. 
When you come out to fight us and stop us from doing what God has said we're going to do, what's going to happen to you? <laughs> this is not going to end how you think it's going to end. Christian, there's a lesson there. This is, again, why our vision has to be long. Because when it's here, I start thinking and worrying. It's the, it's the, Bible, the Bible lesson we were looking at this morning. And um, first, first Kings, oh, my brain just went sideways. Okay, read First Kings, it'll do you good. 18, 19, with Elijah. Elijah goes up Mount Carmel. God brings the fire down. The sacrifice is consumed. Baal is proven to be a fraud. The, the prophets of Baal are slaughtered. And Jezebel goes, I can't believe you killed all my prophets. I'm going to kill you. And Elijah turns into a Monty Python skit and goes, run away! And he does. And he goes and hides in the cave. And then God comes along, what you doing? <laughs> Hiding. Why? Well, they killed all your prophets and it's just me. Okay, first of all, does that, do, do those two things connect? Like you were just standing one man against all the prophets of Baal. And then the queen's like, oh yeah? <gasps> Not to Jezebel. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. But what's the lesson? There's 5,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. I am at work in you. I am work. I am at work in my people. There is a faithfulness beyond you that you're looking towards. That's what Elijah did. Eyes came off of the work that God is doing and focused on what? Just what's going on around him. And it doesn't end well. When we do the same thing, we see what's only going on around us and we miss that there is something else coming. We miss the victory that God has promised and we walk in something else. And anytime you're walking in other than God, you're walking in the lesser thing, you are walking in something that drags you down, tears you apart, and ruins everything that you are. The Israelites have had a good lesson in how broken they are. It's now a chance to do what? Show how faithful they are. And this is again where the temptation comes in. Why is life not always peachy for us? Because I failed over here and I didn't want to fail over here and God, I'm sorry. And I'm back on the road. What gets to happen in 10 feet? I get a chance to do what? To not fail. That's a blessing. Do you know how many times I wanted that as a baseball coach? I'm like, no, no, can you rerun that at bat for that kid? Because I know if you throw him one more pitch, he's going to kill it. I just know it. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's walking back to the dugout with his bat in his shoulder because he just struck out. And he's like, Nyar! God gives you that second chance because God is redeeming and sanctifying you. So he continues to test you. He continues to try you. He continues to temper you and provide a way for you to lean into him. So Moses sends Joshua out. Moses, on the other hand, is going to go to the top of the hill with the staff of God. That doesn't make any sense. Does that make any sense to you? You go fight them. I'm going to go sit in the mountaintop with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> Patience, grasshopper, all shall be revealed. Now, Joshua, verse 10, Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. This is where we get some fun apocalyptic stuff, believe it or not. And by apocalyptic, apocalyptic stuff, I mean pushing you towards a view of the end. First, let's understand the people. Hur is not a her, he is a he. Does that make sense? <laughs> First Chronicles chapter 2. Now Caleb, if you want a fun story, read Joshua and find Caleb and enjoy the story of Caleb. It's, 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 it's fun. Um, Caleb the son of Hezron had sons by Azubah his wife and by Jerioth, and these were her sons, Jeshur, Shobab, and Ardon. And when Azubah died, Caleb married Ephrath, who bore him her. So her is the son of Caleb. I know that's convoluted. Caleb is a fun guy to read in the book of Joshua. You'll enjoy his story. It's worth it. This family of her is kind of a big deal in Israel. Go to the end of this book, Exodus 31. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of her of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all kinds of craftsmanship to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and in bronze and the cutting of stones for settings and in the carving of wood that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. And behold, I myself have appointed him, appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, try to say that name, and of the tribe of Dan and in the hearts of all who are skillful I have put skill that they may make all that I have commanded you. Now, fun trivia. What are they making? Uh, the not the temple. We're not to the temple yet, but you're close. There it is, the tabernacle. 
I, I knew it's what you meant. That's why we, that's why I let you, let you get the second. See, we don't just throw you out of Bible Jeopardy. We let you get a second buzz. And they see, we, we believe in second chances. Isn't that so Christian of us? <laughs> now, what are they building? They're building the, uh, the, the, the elements of the tabernacle, the ark, the mercy seat, the furniture that goes inside of it. Now, here's your second fun. This is where it gets more complicated. So this is your bonus round. What are the elements of the tabernacle pointing to? What's the purpose of the tabernacle? The altar is there, the, the mercy seat above the ark, the ark of the covenant. Remember, the Nazis got fried when they opened that one they shouldn't have. All of the stuff that's in there. He, um, great sermon years ago from a guy whose name I can't remember, is describing all the things in the tabernacle. Like, if you're building a room where you've got to go do a lot of work in, what's one thing you're going to make sure you bring with you? A chair. And what's not in the, what's not in the holy place? There's no chair. There's nowhere to sit down because the priest doesn't sit down while he's in there. He's always working. He doesn't get to sit down. All of the things that are in that tabernacle are meant for worship and sacrifice. The sacrifice of the blood at the altar, the sacrifices of the lamb, the sacrifices of the heifer, all of those things for the people, for the worship of God. Now, what's the sacrificial system of the Old Testament and the worship of the Old Testament to point to? Hebrews chapter 8. The main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heaven. A minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord made, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that his high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, saying, See, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. The point of that system is Christ. Who's the true high priest? It's not anybody from the tribe of Levi. It's Jesus. Who's the sacrifice? It's not the lamb, it's not the bull, it's not the goat, it's Christ. All of those things are meant to point to you, point you to a final sacrifice, a final offering made by Christ in the true tabernacle. Not the one that Solomon has built in Jerusalem, not the one that Moses has built in the wilderness, but the one that stands before God reserved in heaven. It is meant to point them again forward. Every single one of those sacrifices is meant to take the Israelite mind and spirit and move it forward forward, to get them off of themselves and to the worship of God, to get them to the sacrifice of God, the son of the, the seed of the woman who will crush the serpent, the king who is to come, the high priest who knows God face to face, as Deuteronomy mentions. All of those sacrifices are meant to point them forward, to lift up their eyes to God and away from themselves. Welcome to what Christian living is supposed to be. What's the point of our music? To get you to sing about you? No, to get you to sing about God. What's the point of prayer? To get you to worship and understand that your provision and blessings in this world come from the hand of God and to, and to beseech Him to deliver. What's the point of what I do on a Sunday morning? <clears throat> Excuse me. To get you to know your Bible so that you will know what? How often have you heard me pray? Lord, strengthen us that we would know you, love you, trust you, and serve you. Those things all go together because the reason why I do this is because I want you to know more about God. Because I am convinced that the more you know about Him, the more the Holy Spirit will stir up that knowledge inside of you, the more you will love Him for who He is and what He has accomplished on your behalf. The more that you know what He has done for you, the more you will love and appreciate Him, the more you will then seek to orient your lives around Him. That's what the sacrifices were supposed to do. That's why they were all encompassing in life. That is why you went down to Jerusalem three times a year. That is why you counted the herbs of your garden to give them a temple. There was no part of your life that you separated and segregated from God. But all of it was a reminder that there is a God in heaven who has loved us and redeemed us and is at work on our behalf. Welcome to what the New Testament is trying to explain to you about how you pray, how you study, how you train your children, how you go to work, everything in your life to take up your cross daily, every avenue of your life, not separated from God, like, right, here's the God stuff we do on Sundays, and then here's the other stuff we do. No, no, no. All of that stuff meets 
so that we live a totality of our lives as offerings to God because we understand who he is and what he has done. That's what's being pointed to here. That's why we're going up the mountain with these guys. It's the prophet. It is the priest who is going to make sacrifice and it is part of the family that will make the elements of the tabernacle. These are specifically chosen people. It's not like we just say, hey, you, come here. I need you to come up the mountain with me. And again, why did he need to go up the mountain with me? Don't you need to go fight somebody? Well, there's something important that is coming, and that will be next. Verse 11. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed, and when he left his, let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. All right, this is why Moses is up the mountain, but I have a question. Should that matter? I mean, really. What, is, what does this battle look like? like let, make sure we get this into your brain. You're talking about people wandering around in the desert. The Amalekites are a, a, a Negev people. They are the people of the wilderness. It is a harsh environment. I mean, Israel's walking around for days at a time without finding water. The Amalekites live there. They live in that every day. They know where to find water, where to find food, how to live, how to not die on a daily basis. These are hardened, tough people. Do they just go up and go, oh... People out of Egypt with sticks and shovels and rakes. What should we do? <laughs> they, have, they have pointy sticks. Are we sure we can fit? No. These people aren't dying gently. If you're going to beat the Amalekites, you're going to have to do what? Beat them. And you're not going to stand on that side with a cannon. And you don't get to call in an airstrike. You have to do what? You have to kill them closer than I am to Jonathan. I mean, you have to kill them at this distance. As you're engaged in this battle, how often are you going to look up at Moses? <laughs> See, I ask that for a reason. Because you're in the midst of this. Some of your people are running that way. Some of their people are running this way. Where are you looking for the next guy who's trying to kill you? Everywhere. Everywhere. It's like we used to talk about when um, you're playing football. If you're running in the middle of the field, you should have your head on a swivel because always be afraid in the middle of a football field when you're running around and there's no one next to you. Because <laughs> you know what's getting ready to happen? Yeah, you're the next target. You don't know why. You just are. That's the, So in the midst of this, are you going to be like, all right, okay, good. Moses has his hands up. Yes, Moses has his hands up. I'm going to try harder. Oh, Moses put his hands down. I'm not sure I can kill them as easily now. This is dumb, right? This shouldn't matter. Which means, who is really at work when Moses' hands are going up and down? God's. Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. Psalm 20. I know that the Lord saves his anointed, and he will answer him from his holy heaven with saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Lord, may the king answer us in the day that we call. Israel's fighting hard regardless of what Moses is doing. What Moses is demonstrating is an allegiance and faith to God. So God is working on behalf of what Moses is doing. So if you're Moses, what are you going to do? As long as I keep my hands up, God keeps fighting on our side and we're going to be all right. So what do I do if I'm Moses? I'm keeping my hands up. Verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. <laughs> This is like the greatest you had one job in human history. <laughs> like, keep your arms up. You've got one job. And Moses can't do that one job. Why not? Couldn't God have strengthened his hands and his arms to hold them up? He could have, but he didn't, did he? Now here's, every time you see something like that, you should be asking yourself a question. Why not? Why not? Romans chapter 8. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit." God doesn't simply strengthen Moses' hands because if he did, who would get the credit? Moses would probably get the credit. And also beyond that, what would Moses think? What would everybody think? 
we can do this. We got this. Now look, we've been paying attention as we read Exodus. Does Israel got this? No, no. We understand that, but who lies to you the most? So do you think Israel, after this battle and the Amalekites have been wiped out, is going to be standing there going, man, I'm sure glad God is a gracious and loving and forgiving God who overlooked all those times we whined for water and all that time we complained and all that whining we did and gave us this great victory. Is that what they're going to say? They're going to be like, man, look at awesome. Look, look at what we did. Yes! The flesh is, by its very nature, weak. Sin corrupts everything. Not some things, everything. What you're actually getting here is an object lesson. Who's the deliverer of Israel? God is. Who does Israel think the deliverer of Israel is? Moses. To this day, Moses is the deliverer. He's referred to as the deliverer. All you got to do is keep your arms up, man. Keep them up. You got this. Uh, but they're heavy. I'm tired. Is Moses any better than anybody else? No, that's the point. If we're going to get delivered, we've got to have something beyond the flesh. We've got to have something beyond this. So then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. I love this. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his, st his hands were steady until the sun set. How are Moses' arms going to stay up now? Literally by force. If Moses wants to put his arms down now, can he? No. What they did was they put a rock out. So Aaron and her are standing up. Moses is going to sit down and you're going to hold him up. Even if I want to put my arms down, what's going to happen? They're going to hold him. I want to put him down and I can't. Now, we'll make a slight deal out of this. Anything interesting about that position? Luke 23, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and save us. Have you ever wondered why that was actual mocking? Like, are you offended if people say things to you and try to pick on you about things that aren't true? You shouldn't be, because it's what? Like, if somebody walks up to be like, Oh yeah, Mr. Two Heads, that's just dumb. I'm not going to be offended. Your mocking doesn't make any sense if it's not something that's not somewhat true. That's why as kids, what do we all want to do? We want, we want to know as much about you as possible so we can do what? We can find something to pick on you about. Nobody, we, we can't just pick on the new kid because you're the new one. We got to go do what? Who's your parents? Where are you from? When you do? It doesn't matter how, but it's got to be something about you. It's an insult to tell Christ, oh yeah, you're the Christ? Well, get down off the cross. Why is that an actual insult? Why is that a temptation as Christ has been tempted in, we, in all ways as we are and yet without sin? Because he actually is the Christ. And if you are the Christ, can those nails hold you to that cross? No. He could come down anytime he wanted. So what held him there? He's working for the Father. He's trusting in the plan that God has set forth. He's accomplishing redemption. Christ will stay there because of obedience. There is no force that holds him. Um, if you remember, if you were at the Good Friday service, one of the songs that we sang was The Power of the Cross. Was that, wait, no, I'm sorry, I got my name started. How Deep the Father's Love for Us. One of the lines is, It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. There's no force that holds Christ. Christ is holding himself upon that cross. His obedience to the plan of the Father, his obedience to the work of redemption is holding him there. In other words, where the flesh of this deliverer will be weak, the spirit that is within Christ will be strong. There's the difference. Moses is pointing you forward. Is Moses a deliverer? Well, in a, in, a, in, a, in a human perspective, he is. He's not the deliverer. He is a deliverer. God has chosen Moses to lead Israel out. If it wasn't Moses, it would have been somebody else. Is Moses able to deliver the people, though? And the answer to that is, no, God must. Is Christ the deliverer? Yes. 
Is Christ able to lead his people out? Yes. That's the difference. Sometimes an example is what we call a negative example. Moses is showing you the true and good work of Christ by doing what? Failing. Showing you how his flesh is weak and how he as the deliverer of the people cannot accomplish this on God's behalf. God must accomplish. So there's a reason why Aaron and her are going to hold his hands up. Because he can't. He's not capable of saving and rescuing these people. But who is? God is. Once again, the Israelites at the end of this battle, should they be looking to Moses? No. Should they be looking to themselves? No. They should be looking forward to God and what he will do. We are having this victory because Moses held his arms up. No! We're having this victory because the Amalekites will not stand in the way of anything that God has promised to his people. This is the same problem you'll have with Israel in the kingdom years. So they're all terrified because Goliath came out. Well, are you God's people or not? If you are, go kill him, wipe out the Philistines, and redeem the land that God has promised to you. That's, why, that's one of the things that's great about David in that chapter. is he shows up and sees Goliath and he's not like, oh, I wonder if anybody here wants to take him. He's like, hey, what's the king going to give to the guy who kills that dude? From minute one, his attitude is what? This is done. Like, okay, so if he kills me, they win. If I kill him, we win. We're God's people. They're not. Okay, so what do I get? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is over before it has even begun. So was this fight. It was over before it even began. And that's the point. Christian, as we walk in this world, the fight's over. Go read Revelation 19. Lou and I were just talking about that this week. Go read Revelation 19. It's the most anticlimactic fight in history. The armies of evil assemble against God's people. And Christ comes down, you know, the white horse and the, and the, the sash and the sword and the whole bit. And they battle and they set up for the battle and it's like... We're done here. Over. Jesus goes, all right, you guys are all dead and you lose. Oh, man. And that's, that's the end. It's just, it's just done. Defeated. That's what, <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, shoot. I thought we had a chance this time. That's why, that's why we say, don't fall into the trap of dualism. If you want to know what dualism is, watch Star Wars. I'm saying, I'm serious. Star Wars is dualism. There is the force. It is good and it is evil, and they are both always doing what? Sometimes the good is on top, sometimes the evil is on top, and they're always jockeying with each other. That's not how God operates. Satan isn't on the other side as an equal power, you know, and sometimes Satan's doing really well, and sometimes God's doing really well. No! Satan's on a leash, and God holds the other end of it. He is defeated, he is conquered. He is still warring against God because sinners sin, and they do insanely dumb things all the time. We can attest to that because we're sinners. But at the end of the day, he's defeated. He is lost. That's why we don't fear him. That's why Peter says, resist him and he flees from you. Because all you... What's the temptation? Hey, did God really say you can't eat from any of the trees? No, you numbskull. He said don't eat from that one. That should have been the answer. Instead, it's, well, you know, it'll make you wise. No, it don't. Yes, it will. No, it won't. That's not what God told me it'll do, so no, it won't. And we're done here. All of history is over with. You know, throw yourself down. The angels will catch you. Yeah, don't put the Lord your God to the test. That's just dumb. What's the rule? Don't do dumb things. That's resist him firm in the faith. What's the temptations of this world? Won't it be fun? Won't it be good? It'll taste good. It'll feel good. Has it ever tasted good and felt good five minutes after it's over? The answer is no. Because you have to look at yourself in the mirror the next morning and go, Oh, yeah. Why am I looking at an idiot again? Ah. Those are good conversations to have with yourself. Have them regularly. Because you know what they remind you of? To look forward. Deny the flesh. Deny the lusts. Say no when the temptation is strongest because I'm not trusting in you. I'm not listening to you. You're a liar. I'm listening to God. I'm walking in victory because Christ has given me victory. And always remember that that great passage in Romans 8 when we talk about we are more than conquerors, Paul is talking about Christians being killed when he talks about them conquering because they stood in the midst of the greatest temptation. Hey, walk away or we kill you. And they went, sweet, I'm in. Like, I can't walk away. Can't possibly do anything less.
So they conquered. They've won. There's nothing the world can do to them because they have stood faithful. They're looking forward. That's what this is pointing you to. So, yep. i got to flip the page if they don't stick together. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now, I made a mention all morning. This was the expected outcome. We knew before this fight started how this fight was going to end. So, don't miss the implications of how it points us forward. Zechariah chapter 12. I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. So they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. So we've covered this already. Moses is a deliverer for Israel. He is not the deliverer. Who is the deliverer? Jesus is. This Zechariah passage... Here, we'll do a, you get a second trivia question. You ready? What gospel quotes that? They will look upon him whom they have pierced. I mean, you got a, you got a 25% chance. It's John. It's John, the one we went through. Hang on, I'm going to... Okay, I'm over it. <laughs> we only spent like a year and a half going through John, but it's okay. I don't expect you to remember all of it. <laughs> Now, this is quoted by John, but don't miss, and this is again why you never, ever, 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 ever read a Bible verse. Because Zechariah is building. Zechariah spends an entire book building up to the people, condemning the sin, condemning the idolatry, and pointing to the grace of God. Chapter 12 of Zechariah continues with the mourning over this death, over him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 13 shows God undoing the idolatry of the people and judgment coming against the people who have not trusted in him. Zechariah 14, God shows up to battle against his enemies. Guess how that goes? He wins, and what's the result? Zechariah 14, 9. The Lord will be king over all the earth, and in that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. In other words, who will we worship? God. What else will we worship? Nothing. You remember what we did on Easter, 1 Corinthians 15? When all things have been subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. So the Son, who conquers, stands before the Father, and the Father grants all things to the Son, and the Son says, that's awesome. Here you go. <laughs> So that Christ as the man will stand and worship. And Christ as God will be worshipped. He will be all in all. That's what this is supposed to be pointing towards. That's what Israel is supposed to be learning and understanding. Is that God has promised to take you out of Egypt and to bring you to a good land. And you have been brought this far literally kicking and screaming the entire way. We did this last week. They, they crossed the Red Sea after they complained. They were given food after complaining. They were given water after complaining. They've been given more water after judgment and complaining. This people is literally... Like I made a joke about this this week. You know that, um, you know that uh, footprints in the sand picture that was big a few years ago? It was like, as I was walking along with God and I saw there were two sets of footprints... And during the hardest portions of my life, there was only one set of footprints. And I said, God, why did you abandon me during that hard time? And no, my child. And those moments is when I carried you. So the only footprints are God because he's carrying you through. It's beautiful. I'm, I am not that sentimental. So I want to redo that. And what I want to redo it with is, God, I see there's two sets of footprints. But during all the hardest parts of my life, why does it look like a snake ate me? My child, that was when I literally drug you through your sanctification while you complained. Because if we're honest, that's what goes on. That's how this actually works. We don't sit there and go, God, this is too much for me. I need you to carry me. You go, God, why did you do this to me? And the Holy Spirit goes, just walk. <laughs> And what, what, it, what the picture should look like is this drag mark as God's got you going, come on, we're getting through this because you're mine and I am not letting you go. That's what it should look like. That's what has gone on thus far for Israel. What's the point? Keep your eyes where? 
I mean, this this was this was the the twentieth century, the civil rights movement, right? Keep your eyes on the prize. This is what the Christians should be doing. That was borrowing Christian language to keep your eyes on the kingdom, keep your eyes on the Lord. Understand, as we go into this battle, man, Amalekite is doomed. They've got no shot. How do I know that? Because God has promised to take us from Egypt to a good land, and this desert stinks. Therefore, we ain't there yet. Which means, if you stand between what God has promised in me, bad things are going to happen to you. This was the attitude of the church throughout human history. This is why they could look at the Roman government and say, no, you're going to lose. See, there's this rock cut without hands, and it's going to smash every kingdom. Your kingdom just happens to be next on the list. It may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but if you continue to stand in opposition to God, bad things are going to happen to you. And I pray that they don't. But if this is the path you walk, so be it. That's what Jesus says. You can proclaim the gospel, but if they don't listen, what do you do? Shake the dust off your feet. Move on to the next place. You can't make them believe. You can't change their heart. Only God can. And if they are so stubborn that they are hardened in their delusion, then you leave them and move on to someone who isn't. This is how we have to live, Christian. Keep mentioning the story of what's going on in the world. Um... Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. They showed up to have church. Some of the people did, a couple hundred people. So let's see. They told the church you couldn't meet. The church met anyway. So they arrested the pastor. The church met anyway. They left the pastor in jail for 35 days. The church met anyway. They let him out. He went back to church, and they had church anyway. So the health department showed up and built two fences and said, you can't come in. So when a couple hundred people gathered to have church outside, they sent 200 armed officers to stop them. I didn't know there were 200 armed officers in Canada. I thought Canada was like Canada nice. I have no idea what's going to happen today. Yeah. The world is losing its mind. I mean, if I told you, all right, you ready? Here's, here's your game. There's a country. Starts with a C. Ends with an A. And they hate the church, and they will beat you if you try to show up, and they will lock your church and throw your pastor in prison. What is it? China. It's not China. It's Canada. I mean, this, that's my, my first thought would be, that's China. That's, that's what the evil communists do. That's China. That's North Korea. That's Canada. And if we're not careful, it's probably going to be California next. And you already know where we live. Everything California does, we're about how many minutes behind them? <laughs> What do we do? What do we do? We walk faithfully. If you continue to stand in opposition against God, bad things are going to happen to you. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But you need to turn to Christ. If that is not resolute in your mind, then you are walking in something else. When John talks about they went out of us because they were not of us, those are the people he's talking about. They were grounded and planted on something other than Christ. So when speed bumps and potholes in their pathway to the kingdom came, they fell, broke an ankle, landed in the ditch, and that was the last anybody saw them. And it was done. Because they were not grounded in Christ. They were not, as Luther said, anchored in the scriptures. And they were not looking to the salvation that is yet to be revealed. They're looking up to, they're in the middle of a battle going, has Moses got his arms up or not? Because I don't know how hard I should be fighting. No, we do what? We go to war, day in and day out, faithfully knowing that we're, we're progressing towards a kingdom that God has promised. I mean, this, this was that Chris Tomlin song, where it was late 90s, early 2000s. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? There's a reason why he sang that line like 28 times. One, that's just what Chris Tomlin does. It does make him a bad guy. But every song's got to have that part where he repeats it like 28 times. It's okay. But that, isn't that the lesson? If God is with us, who can stand against us? Nobody, which is why I keep saying, if you continue to stand against God, bad things are going to happen to you. And Christian, we have to know that and we have to be willing to proclaim that. Because conversely, if we continue to stand faithfully with God, no matter what they do to us, what's going to happen? They're going to fall and we're going to receive the blessings of salvation and communion and peace with God. And that will never change. So Joshua's overwhelming them. And by the way, this is why I asked you earlier, was this a good time for this battle for Israel when they're in the lowest of their lows? And the answer was, yeah, no, maybe. You know what the answer is? 
Yes. Because they just messed this up, and what does God do? All right, here we go. Let's, we're doing it again. We're going around the mountain one more time. Here we go. Whee! That's, that's the book of Numbers. I don't think we'll get there. That's what's going on here. When they're in the lowest of their low, where is God? Not just even pushing forward. When we are brought low and we look up and see Christ, how exalted is he? This is why James talks about humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Because the lower I am, the greater he is. This is why I say when you have that conversation, we look in the mirror and be like, why, why, why? Have that conversation because you know what you're doing? You're rightly realizing who you are in the sight of God. And then you can stand with Isaiah and go, woe is me. Woe is me. And then you can also quote Paul and say what? But thanks be to God. See, yes, yes. This is why we mourn our sin and then we get moving again. That almost rhymes. I gotta, gotta, gotta write that one down. <laughs> Every once in a while, I get a gem, right? This is why we do. This is why we don't wallow in our sin and we don't go. Oh, I can't believe I did this. And I because what am I doing? Where am I looking? I'm looking at me. I'm not, okay. That was dumb. Let's not do that again. Let's get back to walking focused on Christ because when I see how stupid that was, I see how brilliant he is. When I see how lost and dark that place is, I see how glorious and bright shining the salvation of Christ is. I see the darkness rightly because there's light to see and I rejoice. That's how we live. That's why Israel gets this now, which is again why I say, when you're traveling on that highway, when you hit that pothole, okay, great. Get back on the road and know what's coming. What's coming next? Come on, you know. You're going to get about 12 feet, and what's going to happen again? You live in Illinois. There's going to be another pothole. Yeah. Isn't that the joke? Come on. In the United States, we drive on the right, and in, the, uh, in England, they drive on the left. In the Midwest, we drive on what's left. <laughs> yeah, we drive on what's left. Christian, that's what we do in our walk. God does not pave a beautiful road for us. He pot marks the tar out of that thing so that you will not trust in you but trust in him. So that you will pick your eyes up and keep looking with faithfulness going, this car shouldn't be on this road, but for some reason it keeps doing what? It just keeps driving. This is the lesson of Noah and the ark. That boat shouldn't make it as volcanoes and tornadoes and hurricanes and everything's going on. That boat shouldn't survive. And yet it did what? It did because God preserved it. That jalopy we're driving down the king's highway trying to get to the salvation ready to be revealed shouldn't make it. But by God's grace, as we keep moving forward, it does. That's why they get the battle and that's why they get it now. Christian, that's why you get the battle and that's why you get it right there. That's why you're going, I'm not ready for this. Exactly. But Christ is. And what's the way of escape? The way of escape of your temptation is to trust in God and walk in His ways. You're not ready for that, which is why you cling to Him and trust in what He is doing. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write in the book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You keep opposing God. Bad things are going to happen to you. 1 Samuel 15. You actually want to see what this looks like if you're disobedient? Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to appoint you as king over his people over Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. I love that reminder. I made you king. Listen. Thus says, thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel and how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. By the way, that's... 400 years from this battle. God doesn't forget. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman and child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. In other words, wipe out everything. Now, we, if you know your first Samuel, so my Wednesday night Bible study guys will know this, Saul is just an excellent example of faithfully following God, right? Yeah, no, no. Bible trivia time. The king of the Amalekites is a guy named Agag, or Agog, or however you want to say it. I'm just going to go with Agag because it gets the vowels in there right. Samuel has to actually kill Agag. Saul's failure causes problems. Because get to book like, say, Esther, chapter 3. After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite. Guess what an Agagite comes from? 
from Agag of the Amalekites. Haman in Esther wants to do what? Wipe out Israel. So because of Saul's failure, you fast forward another couple hundred years and the Amalekites are still standing in the way of God and his people. And if you do that, bad things are going to happen to you. may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But what happens to Haman? And what happens to the Amalekites at the end of Esther? They get wiped out. God accomplishes his purposes. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. So Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, The Lord has sworn the Lord will wage war, will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. In other words, God will be praised because who will fight our enemies? He will. Psalm 28. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard my voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart exalts, and with my song I shall thank him. The Lord is their strength, and he is a saving defense to his anointed. Save your people, bless your inheritance, be their shepherd also, and carry them forever. And he does. Now who knows what a banner is? He names it, The Lord is My Banner. What's a banner? I know this one because I can't forget it because my, um, my grandfather was John Roland Banner II, and their wedding anniversary was June 14th. And I know that because my grandmother told me this joke because she was start slightly senile in her 80s and told me this joke every time I was around. The reason why their anniversary is June 14th is what holiday is June 14th? Flag Day! And my grandmother's joke was, I became a banner on Flag Day. Because a banner is a flag. That was her joke for years. I became a banner on flag day. And I was like, yes, Grandma, I know. <laughs> so I always remember that. And I will never forget their anniversary, even though they've both been gone for 10 years. And I will always remember that. The Lord is my banner. He is my flag. He is the thing that I carry into battle that identifies me as his. He is my identification. He is who I am. He is what I walk in. When you look and see us walking across, you go, ooh, there's the Lord's people. See, that's the flag right there. I know it. This is how we're supposed to walk. Luke 9. Jesus was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever, wishes to, whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul? In other words, what in this place is worth giving up God? Every time we indulge in our sin, you know what we're saying? That thing was. It was worth it. Now when it's over with, we say what? It wasn't worth it. Christian living is a strengthening of the heart, mind, and soul to recognize those moments and learn to say, Gee! now I already know where that one reads. I'm going that way. I already know what that is. Because something worse is always coming. Very few people walk a Christian life and nothing is, nothing is wrong. I mean, there are those people. Like, everything just seems to work out for them. Nothing ever seems to go wrong. And we all rightly hate them. Because <laughs> it's so annoying. You're like, mm, schizophrenic. Remember that? That was that kid in school. But like, I didn't even study. And I got a 93. I don't even like you. Go over there. Okay? We're not friends. <laughs> Put your head down before I play whack-a-mole. My wife was like, ooh, that was me. That's because you didn't go to a real school. But that's a different conversation. And she acknowledges that. No, I, I've told her. I said, I wish I could have gone to your school. I, I could have shown up like half the time and ace your classes. But that's, sometimes small private schools are very interesting. And sometimes they're very not schools. But anyway, <laughs> it's a whole different discussion. That's not life. And if you'll notice, the longer you've gone in Christian living, if you've walked that road, five 10, 15, 30 years. The stuff you deal with now, is it easier than the stuff you dealt with back then? Not typically. And you're like, I should be better at this. This should be easier. I'm smarter. I'm not dealing with the same sin issues. I'm living in holiness more. I read my Bible more. I pray more. I should be better at dealing with the things of the world. Why do the things of the world keep getting harder? Because God is going to make sure every last ounce of sin is squeezed out of you. 
and he's going to refine you in the process of doing it. What we do is remember who do we belong to and what do I do this day? This was Joshua's call. Look, when Israel finally gets to the land, what's Joshua's final message to them? Choose for yourselves this day. Not tomorrow. Not five minutes from now. Choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. I said five minutes. Five years from now, sorry. Because guess what you're going to have to do tomorrow? You're going to have to wake up and say, choose for myself this day who I will serve. And choose for myself right now. And choose for myself right now. And choose for myself right now. That's what taking up your cross daily looks like. Well, I took up my cross on Tuesday. Isn't that enough? No. No, it isn't. I take it up today, and I'll take it up tomorrow, and the day after that I'll take it up, and I'm going, well, what about Thursday? I don't care about Thursday. You know why? It's not here yet. And you know what? You know when I'll get the grace to deal with that temptation? When I get there. If we're struggling in this walk, and we're struggling to be faithful, it's because we are not trusting in that moment. So what do I do? What's tempting me? What's drawing on my flesh? What's the problem? All right, now I know what I go crucify. Now I know what I bring to Christ in prayer. Now I know what I bring to my fellow brothers in confession. Now I know what I look for in advice and counsel. I know all of these things so that I can now attack it head on. I can do like Israel. I can charge into battle and be like, guess where we're going? We're going through you because you're in the way, and that's the problem. Did every Israelite survive that battle? No. But as they faithfully followed after God, did they lose anything? No. No, they didn't. That's what we have to remember. We don't win every battle. We may not win every war. God is undefeated. The Amalekites went to war this day, 1491 B.C. They're not going to get wiped out until the time of Esther, literally almost a millennia later. May not be today. May not be tomorrow. If you continue to stand against God, bad things are going to happen to you. But Christian, it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. If you continue to walk faithfully in Christ, the kingdom will be there at the end. And that's where we walk, and that's what we trust in. Let's pray.